Okay, this is the intro to the Sabbath service for the 25th of May, 2019. I'll give the Hebrew date when we go live. We're streaming live this morning on the Sabbath page of Facebook Live. And this recording will go into the archive. We'll begin just as soon as we get a green light from Facebook Live. And good morning, brethren, and welcome to the Sabbath service for this 20th day of the second month on God's holy sacred calendar. It's the 25th day of May 2019 on that pagan Roman calendar. And happy Sabbath. Good morning, everybody. It's 9.30 a.m. in the central time zone of the United States. Should be 2.30 p.m in the afternoon 2 30 p.m in the united kingdom greetings italia and others of you who watch from the united kingdom and uh, what do we have this morning as we as we wake up we're going to do a uh, we'll start with a hymn that will hopefully help wake us all up and uh, although sometimes you know feel like it's too early to sing but i'm going to be sure we uh, start out with one that's got the ambassador corral accompaniment in the background uh, because that way you won't have to hear my morning voice so much and let's start with for the time being let's start with hymn number one uh, a wonderful hymn to sing that uh, gives a good message blessed and happy is the man who never walks astray we'll be back up with the uh, by the ambassador corral Let's all sing it together. First one, blessed and happy. Everybody on verse 2.
All right, brethren, thanks to those of you who uh, sang along with us on that first hymn. And let's uh, rock and roll on over to another one. I think it's good to, uh, to, to sing from time to time and remember. Actually, uh, let's do that one later after we're a little more awakened because there's only piano accompaniment. And so I think we have another one we could sing that has the chorale accompaniment with it. Psalm number four, page three in the purple hymnal. Uh, and um, Walter, you can see uh, I have that uh, purple hymnal in our um, collection. The The front cover on this one may be a little different than the one you, you sent me yesterday, but uh, I think I actually modified this and made it a special uh, made it kind of a special display for when we're, you know, singing along and illustrating this here. But let's all go sing together. Psalm 4, trust in God and stand in awe. To sing along with the chorale, beginning here with verse 1. again for those of you who sang along with us and uh, without any further ado this morning let's get into another one of the sermons by God's end time apostle Herbert W. Armstrong this one he's speaking from 1979 as the ambassador for truth or the ambassador of truth God's end time apostle put his lower third up here on the screen as we begin Herbert W. Armstrong. Consider, how could anyone come to know these truths, which are the truth about who and what is God, what and why is mankind, why were we ever put on the earth, what is the purpose, uh, what is a man, what was the gospel, what is salvation? All of these things. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They didn't believe what he said. God said if they took to that wrong tree that they would surely die. What was that tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And mankind was cut off from God. All except those that God himself would choose and call. That is the greatest uh, thing that is, is misunderstood by more professing religionists and churches of anything. I don't say it's the worst thing, I say it is the most prevalent. 
They all believe that now this is God's world. God is trying to get everyone saved. This is not God's word. The Bible says world. God says this is Satan's world. And God right there cut humanity off from him. And the nations have not known about God. But now look what God did do. God talked to Noah because Noah had been a righteous man. I don't know that he was especially seeking God or that he really knew God, but he was of pure generation as to his birth. He also was a righteous man in a world of, that was entirely corrupt. And God told him to build the ark to save him and his family alive to protect, uh, to preserve uh, humanity on the earth. And all but eight souls, eight people, were, were drowned in that great flood. Now God came to Ab uh, Abram, as his name first was, then Abraham, and uh, Abraham uh, just, just responded immediately. He is one man who didn't make the excuse, oh God, get someone else. That's why he's the father of, of the faithful. That's why all of the promises of the eternity of you and me are the promises that were made to Abraham and in the one sense, spiritually, uh, we become the human children of Abraham through Christ if we have God's salvation. And uh, then came after that Moses. Bo Moses did not seek God. He wasn't trying to find God. Moses wasn't seeking for these truths that I've been telling you about. Moses didn't know any of these things I've been mentioning. And he wasn't just hungry to know and seeking to know, not anything of the kind. But he was coming back from his father-in-law's place, Jethro, and there was that burning bush. And of course, all of you know very well that incident of the burning bush. He saw it before he came to it, and he walked up to it, and then on past it. And then he turned back and looked, and for some reason, there, there didn't seem to be much, uh, I don't know where the little firewood or what was burning, but there was very little there, and he wondered, why doesn't it burn up? Well, now, the Bible says God was in that bush and spoke to him, at least the voice of God. He said, Moses, take your shoes from off your feet, for the ground where you're standing is holy ground. What made it holy? God's person there made it holy. Now God told Moses he was, had chosen him and was calling him to lead his fellow countrymen, the Israelites, out of Egyptian slavery. But Moses wasn't seeking anything like that. He said, oh, now wait, if in modern language, he said, hold on there a minute, God, uh, just count me out. You see, uh, oh, I couldn't do it, God. I've got an impediment to speech. I should, I should, I should, I should stutter. God says, I know you stutter, and I have taken care of that. I have chosen your brother Aaron to be your spokesman and speak for you. You will do what I say, and Moses did. And so this knowledge was revealed to Moses. How did Moses know what's in these first five books of the Bible? Moses didn't dream it up. It was revealed to him by God. And God talked directly to Moses. That's the only way. Otherwise, he never would have found out. Now take the Apostle Paul, who wrote the next largest uh, portion of the Bible, a great many books in the New Testament. Paul wasn't uh, seeking uh, God necessarily, and he certainly wasn't seeking Christ or Christianity. He was out seeking Christians to haul them in to uh, be persecuted and even put to death. But God caused him to fall down temporarily blinded. And God spoke in a voice that he heard and the people with him didn't even hear it. And Paul said, well, well who, who, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus that you are persecuting. Why do you persecute me? Well, he said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? God had arranged for a man by the name of Ananias to show him what he was to do, and Paul did. Now then, Paul had three years that are unaccounted for down in Arabia. But later, Paul said, 
Have I not seen Christ? Have I not been with Christ? How did the apostle Paul get the knowledge that he wrote in the New Testament? He got it direct from Christ. How did the original apostles get what they did? And, uh, well, uh, some of them, Matthew and James and John uh, and Peter, all wrote uh, part of the Bible in the New Testament. They got it directly from Christ. Now then, if you will turn to John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me. He just can't do it. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. If God doesn't draw you, if God, God doesn't call you, you can't come. And if God had not called you, none of you could have come to him. God is not trying to save the world now. Let me go just a little bit further. One more scripture, Romans 3, 11, where it says, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. People are not seeking after God, really. And they have not been seeking after God. Abraham did not seek for God. God just called Abraham. Now, Abraham is a little bit different from most other men. When God called him, he didn't say, oh, no, no, God, just count me out. When God was calling me, I didn't want to come either. I was just like these other fellows. I wanted to be in the advertising business. That's what I chose. Peter wanted to be a fisherman. And Jesus said to all of his apostles, you did not choose me, I chose you. It's those that God has called. And everyone God has called, now this is just as important as the, uh, the uh, corollary that I said to begin with, that uh, God calls no one just as a favorite to get salvation. He calls only those he has something to do. Now, I know how I was called. As God struck the apostle Paul down and blinded temporarily, although it was restored after he uh, woke up and decided he would serve uh, Jesus Christ, uh, God struck me down in a different way altogether. And I think you all know about it. Now, to make a long story short, my mind was swept clean and I said, here is the word of God. I will believe what it says. And little by little, God began to reveal to me what he said. Well, this work knows and understands God's truth. Old Testament prophecies had it revealed from God. The New Testament apostles were taught it by Christ. And Jesus is the personal word of God. And as I said a while ago, the Bible is the word of God in print or in writing. And they didn't have it in print, you know, until about uh, some 400 years ago, four or 500 years ago. Now, how did you come to know the truth? You were raised up too in all this Babylon of confusion. How did the truth get to you? God got it there, but what means did God use in getting that truth to you? I wonder how many of you realize you got it from me, directly or indirectly. If you didn't get it directly from me, you got it from someone else who had gotten it from me. And you haven't had to go through it a little at a time like I did 50, beginning 52 years ago. You've had it all laid out, all ready for you. You know, if I think, if I had found something like that, I would really appreciate it, brother, and I really think I would. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. Now, there are two prophecies for our time that I would like to call your attention to. Back in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, you will read here, uh, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Now, this was speaking of John the Baptist in the wilderness of the Jordan River, preparing the way for the first coming of Christ. New Testament passages make that absolutely certain. 
saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now in verse 6 it says again, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? Now the scene begins to change. And coming to verse 9, it is an entirely different thing. Now I want you to notice. Verse 9, O Zion. Now Zion either means the ancient city of David, or it means the church. Now the church is often called Zion in the Bible. O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. Now good tidings is good news. And what is the definition of the word gospel? It means good news. So this is talking about Zion that brings the gospel. That cannot mean the physical ground south of Jerusalem. Therefore, it has to mean the church. It doesn't mean the Zionist movement because they have never, uh, never come to know the gospel. So it means the church. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings or the gospel. I was in Jerusalem only about a month ago. And I was very highly honored by about everybody who is anybody in Jerusalem from uh, the president and from uh, uh, Mr. Begin, who is the prime minister and the foreign minister and the deputy prime minister and uh, members of the cabinet and the mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kollek, who was a very close friend of mine. And I had helped them in building some things over there, and I have been a participant in the um, uh, uh, ICCY, the International Cultural uh, Center for Youth, where uh, they are teaching the youth of uh, uh, Arabs and Jews to uh, come into a peaceful relation with each other. So I have my name twice in the city of Jerusalem now. O Zion, that bring us good tidings, Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest, see the gospel, good tidings. Get thee up, lift up thy voice with strength. Now lift up uh, your voice with strength. It didn't say that for John the Baptist back at the coming, uh, first coming of Christ. But today we have things I didn't have in those days. I have a microphone right here. We have amplification of uh, sound. And this says, to lift up your voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid. And I'm not going to be afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold that your God. God is preparing the way for me to say that very thing before the cities of Judah, or the towns and villages of Judah, as some of the translations give it in the English language. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his reward is with him, and his work before him, and another place, his arm will rule for him. And I happen to be strong arm or arm strong, whichever way you want to record. If there's any significance to that, I don't know. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule with him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Brethren, we're doing that work. What do we call it? We call it the work. And it's before his coming. Now that voice is going to cry out. And John the Baptist was only a forerunner. Now I don't mean in any way to belittle John the Baptist because Jesus Christ said of all of the men ever born, none was greater than John the Baptist. It isn't, it, it isn't how great is the man. I'm talking about how great is the, the mission itself. And I think so far as the greatness of man is concerned, I think we've been degenerating all the time. I don't think we're as great today as they were in that day. But next now, I'd like to have you notice in Malachi, the third chapter, last book in the Old Testament. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek, which is Christ, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, he shall come. Now then, that has a dual application. And uh, in uh, Matthew, Mark, and, uh, and, and John, in the New Testament, you will find that, that uh, it is identified that uh, John the Baptist was the man there identified. But read on a little bit. 
The next verse says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner, and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord, or the Eternal, an offering of righteousness. Did that ever happen at the first coming of Jesus Christ? Not at all. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, or the Eternal, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. He did not do that when Jesus came the first time. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the swearers and against those that oppose the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and to turn aside the stranger from the right, and fear not me, says the Lord of hosts. All of those verses show that this messenger to prepare the way is a messenger before the second coming of Christ. So just as it was in the prophecy in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, here is a duality. First there were John the Baptist in the wilderness of the Jordan River, preparing the way for a physical Jesus to come to a physical building and a physical people with a prophecy that he would uh, build uh, his kingdom. Secondly, there's a messenger coming, announcing out, out of the spiritual wilderness of all of these religions and a mixed up world in confusion today, announcing the soon coming of Christ to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and to bring us peace at last. I talk to men that don't know the way to peace, heads of government. One of the last things that Emperor Haile Selassie did before they took him, and he died in the captivity of the overthrow of his government, was to send me congratulations on my 82nd birthday. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. Now, not one knows the way to world peace. I go around the world, and I probably know more heads of government, kings, presidents, emperors, of which there's only one left now. There were two, of whom I, I've known them both, and prime ministers. than almost anybody else, or shall I say, Henry Kissinger. But I go as an ambassador without portfolio, an ambassador for world peace. And I go proclaiming the only sure hope of that world peace. I talk to these kings not to try to get them converted, I talk to them about their own problems because that's what Jesus Christ would talk to them about if he were here. Problems that are too great for them to handle. One king of one very well-known great nation said to me, Mr. Armstrong, I need your help and you're the only one that can help me. Mr. Rader was with me. He said, Mr. Rader, you can't help me. No one else can help me. He had a problem. His mountain people were illiterate, and they had gone from r raising foodstuffs, vegetation, and so on, vegetables. They had gone into raising poppies for the narcotic trade. And he wanted to stamp it out. I sent a team of about seven of our men over there to investigate for 10 days what was needed and what help we could do. They came back and told me, as a result, we started with seven portable schools. And I sent our agricultural expert from uh, Big Sandy, Texas. If we were going to help transfer and educate those uh, illiterate farmers, back to raising foodstuffs again, we had to also supply a market for their produce. And we have accomplished that. 
That's one of the things we've done. If anyone except someone representing Jesus Christ had done it, the world would laud them to the skies. The reason is because I represent Jesus Christ, and this world doesn't love Jesus Christ. It doesn't believe him. Adam and Eve didn't believe what God said when they saw him in person. Jesus Christ preached to thousands when he was here, and only 120 believed what he said, as you will find in the very 15th verse of the second chapter, or the first chapter of the book of Acts. They just did not believe what he said. <clears throat> Later, we were able to double that into 12 portable, uh, portable schools. And actually, it had to be their military men who made it because it was so close to the communist border. And the last time I saw the king of Thailand, King Bhumipal, I said, by the way, how have we come with this program that we're cooperating with? He says, 95% of the um, opium trade has been, has been stamped out and 95% have been turned back to raising vegetables and, and foodstuffs. Well, today, in the latter part of the 20th century, here is what Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 24 and verse 14. When they had asked Jesus for a sign, how would they know when we're near the end of this world? and just before Christ comes for the wonderful world tomorrow, the world's only and its only sure hope. Because we're in, in, in really terrible times now, and everybody knows it. It's a world full of evils of almost every kind. But he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now that is the gospel of the kingdom. That is the gospel that we preach. That is what we've been called for. That is the purpose of this church. Now today, from this church of God, a voice cries out with amplified power, the power of radio and television, and with the printing press in multiple millions of copies, a magazine that now has passed some of the great weekly magazines. As John the Baptist cried out from the physical wilderness 1900 years ago of the Jordan River about the coming of the human physical Jesus to the material temple built of stone and other materials, woods and other materials, and to the physical people of Judah announcing the future, more than uh, 1900 years future, of the establishment of the kingdom of God, so today the living Christ is sending forth this church to cry out from the spiritual wilderness of religious confusion, announcing the soon coming of the glorified, all-powerful Christ to his spiritual temple, and that temple he's coming to is a spiritual temple, which is this church that will be then born again. It's a pity that so many don't understand what God means and the Bible means by born again. We will be resurrected. We won't be human. We won't be flesh and blood anymore. We will be composed of spirit as God is. Born sons of God. And he is coming to that spiritual temple resurrected, and for the purpose now not of announcing but setting up that kingdom of God to rule all the earth and to bring peace and happiness to this terrible, uh, terribly sick world as it is today. All right, for, uh, brethren, an uh, outstanding program this morning. I think you'll agree. Or uh, uh, It was put into a 1979 World Tomorrow telecast. It was an excerpt from a sermon that Mr. Armstrong was giving in Tucson in that same year, 1979. And I've got another one now that was broadcast in 1979, but he was actually speaking in toward the end of 1978. 
that we're going to play in a minute. But I want to discuss a couple or three things from from this. Uh, let me check here and let's see if we can get our. Um, yeah, there are a few things from this um, sermon excerpt that Mr. Armstrong was given that I want to cover, and uh, one of them will be some things in 1 Corinthians 17. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians 7. And there are a couple of other things from the um, telecast this morning that Mr. Armstrong mentioned that I, I want to cover. I want us to sing a hymn first, though. And uh, one of the, I just mentioned one of those things that... Uh, he mentioned that I want to cover it is is real simple where he asked the question during this sermon how did you come into the truth and uh, and then he explained that whether you heard it directly from him or through someone else you really they got it from him we'll talk about that in a moment but what I wanted to say in regard to uh uh, how did you come into the truth if any of you would welcome the opportunity to Take your phone or whatever device you have for making a video and making a one minute, two minute, five, six minute, like in Spokesman's Club, uh, icebreaker type of thing. And just tell how you came into the church. You know, a lot of us were used to doing that, and it was suggested, recommended, suggested that we do that on the night to be much observed when you were getting together in small family size settings in people's homes for the night to be much observed, that the host open up and allow everyone around the table to, uh, you know, and, or invite them, encourage them to, you know, one after another, just tell briefly how you came into God's church, how God called you, um, or, you know, how you came into the truth. And it, it's, it's interesting. It was, always, it was always a little bit different for everybody, even if they tuned into a broadcast, there were circumstances in their life that you could see God engineering and working that. And in, today, some people come in because, well, some of these, even some of these um, banana peeling groups out there, they stumbled on them on the internet, and then they find out they ain't got it all quite together, and you keep looking, and you, you know, and you keep learning and growing, and, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But I, I, I would... Uh, if some of you want to do that, make a little video and send it to me, I'll, uh, next week or so, maybe I'll play a series of those. That might be an interesting thing for us to do as we kind of get to know who, know some of the brethren. I plan a little bit later going out today, God willing, to, uh, us to just fellowship after their service. They welcome me to do that. I always bring along some chocolate or something. They're very happy. They have a little fellowship room after service. And even if I don't come and attend their service, they're, they, hey, there's Stephen with the chocolate. <laughs> and, and they welcome me. They're, they're, they never get on to me. Why didn't you come in and sit in on our service? Once in a blue moon, I do. The particular one where I'm going, though, there's a reason that relates to one of you, uh, Ben, I don't think you'll mind if I just say your first name. There's a fellow in that assembly who has a very similar situation to you. When God called him, he was already married. And at this moment in time, it seems that God hasn't called his wife yet. But that's one reason I've got 1 Corinthians 7 up on the screen. We're going to go to that. Uh, after we sing a hymn and after Mr. Armstrong speaks again, uh, because it points out, and I'll just put the scriptures on the screen that illustrate how that points out that uh, it's okay. If, you know, if, if your wife is pleased to dwell with you and God hasn't called her, uh, that's, that's fine. You, uh, you were already married to her, you, and, and it even encourages us. We'll go through the scriptures that you should continue to, long as she's happy with or okay with your religion is it it's it's fine to, it's not only fine to stay together you can't leave her god says you need to stay there with her as long as she's pleased to dwell with you keep up the love and there's a fellow in that congregation that has the same situation i want to tell him about you and maybe a way y'all can if he's on facebook maybe y'all can connect that might be a good thing and 
keep one another encouraged. He, his wife is kindly toward the church, even though God hasn't called her, and it works nice. I think you guys might enjoy getting to know one another. I'm going out there just to let him know that, hey, his name's David. His first name is David, and just to let him know David. There's another fellow I know has situation that you have, and it's working fine for him, working for, you know, still working fine for you. Once in a while she gets sick. But we'll go over those scriptures about how your conduct, she's not cut off from God like the rest of the world is if she should want it. So, and she's looking to you and your example. You're in a very special position. We'll look at those scriptures in a moment. And let's see, let me make a good, strong mental note that uh, when I bring up what Mr. Armstrong said in this one, in fact, before we play the other one, I should do that because then we'll have another subject on our mind. I want to say a few things regarding how he said uh, that if you've come to the truth, it's because God was working through one man in this end time, and that's this end time apostle whom God has not replaced, Herbert Armstrong. We've, uh, and one of you signed on saying, hey, I love Mr. Armstrong. He's outstand, not only outstanding speaker, but as you probably noticed, if you were paying careful attention this morning in the sermon excerpt he was giving from, where was he? He was uh, in Tucson in this one this morning, the first one this morning. We'll go to Big Sandy for the next one. But that was packed full of things that are good to have refreshed in our mind. Uh, about the truth, uh, just packed full. And um, so, yeah, uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that people are happy to continue to hear Mr. Einstein, and we should. God has preserved it, uh, caused the recordings to be available, and, you know, we don't even have to do it on the sly. They've been put into the public domain, which the way things were going with the apostates, that seems to be a miracle. <laughs> you know, God can even inspire the mind of, as he says, kings of the pagan world. You know, he and, and there are some who would have not been so gracious. Uh, there were some who tried to burn all Mr. Armstrong's stuff. But thankfully, they weren't in the you know, position, and there's a certain thanks we could, we should give for the ones God has in office over the apostates that had control of things that they put into the public domain and uh, are either sold it in such a way that it's because of the arguments the, those who made on behalf of the stuff they bought in a settlement, uh, their arguments were that it it could not be copyright restrained. So even though they bought the copyrights, their own arguments make it available for everybody else. So, you know, it's really God's doing, and there's going to, going to come a time, the 1335, where God's going to cut all that off from availability via the Internet. Now, if you've been able to save it down to your computer and all that, you know, great, you've got it. But uh, it really should be up here. We just continue to replay them to refresh those things. And uh, all right, let's, let's take a moment of refreshing. Let's sing a hymn together. This one, I'm going to have to sing along with you. And only we only have a piano accompaniment version of this hymn number uh, from Psalm number five. Let's see, let me get that word to come full screen on the. Oops, let's see, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Let me come back. Well, I'm trying to, oh, I see why I hit, I'm still hitting the wrong button. Here, we can make this come full screen where we can see it all. This is from page four in the purple hymnal from Psalm 5. Give ear unto my words, O Lord. Let's all sing this one together, and then we'll transition after that into another sermon excerpt by Mr. Armstrong. Give ear unto my words, O Lord. Let's all begin on verse one. Give ear unto my words, O Lord, my meditation way. Hear my loud cry, my King, my God, for I to Thee will pray. Boom, boom. Lord, Thou shalt early hear my voice, I early will I read my prayer to Thee. 
an answer will expect. Verse 2, for thou art not a God who does in wickedness delight. No evil shall abide with thee, nor fool stand in thy sight. All evil doers thou dost hate, cut off shall liars be. The bloody and deceitful man abhorred is by thee. Let's all finish on verse 3. But I into thy house will come in thy abundant grace, and I will worship in thy fear toward thy holy place. Because of watchful enemies, holy me by thy grace, and I in thy righteousness thy way make straight before my face is flesh on verse 4 let all who trust in thee be glad and shouts their praise proclaim thou savest them let all rejoice who love thy holy name for Lord unto the righteous man Nothing like singing a hymn to kind of help wake you up in an early morning. Thanks for those of you who sang along with us here from your home. And, uh, hey, and Patrick, glad to hear. I saw your note that it finally the audio echo straightened out for you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, we're going to go to another hymn by Mr. Armstrong, but I did say we'd cover just a couple of things from, the, not another hymn, another sermon excerpt. I am still waking up, brethren, on uh Hope you'll bear with me on the early mornings. We get on early so that as people in the United Kingdom requested, we'd still have the service live while it's still the Sabbath over there before sunset. It's now from the time we signed on, it would have been 2.30, a few minutes after 2.30 a.m. I'm sorry, 2.30 p.m., you know, 2.30 in the afternoon in the United Kingdom. Still a few hours of sunset left to go. Uh, Few, uh, still a few hours of daylight before sunset left to go. All right, now, um, I mentioned to you that Mr. Armstrong mentioned that if, if you've been called into the truth, even if you're not, as you came into it, you didn't hear it directly from Mr. Armstrong, you really did di indirectly, because even the groups that are out there that are, preaching some of the truth of Mr. Armstrong. I say some because I haven't seen one yet that has not compromised something here, something there. Uh, and that's why we stay with as many recordings of Mr. Armstrong as we can. Even when, brethren, when I give, as if it were a sermon or a sermonette, you know, we have enough of Mr. Armstrong that you can hear. If I were to get off track somewhere, you, you'd, you'd know it because Mr. Armstrong pack so much into when he speaks, uh, you know, he, he covers the things people are compromising on, all of them. And if, if I'm mentioning what I just mentioned, if you ever do hear something that's not just a tongue slip that's obvious, I should have said 1 Corinthians 7 when I said 1 Corinthians 17, you know, even Mr. Armstrong would make tongue slip mistakes like that. But uh, if you hear something that you say, hey, wait a minute, Stephen, that's off track from what God's end time apostle was teaching or left as a doctrine, you're welcome. Not only welcome to let me know, I encourage you to let me know. Hit me with it. Uh, you know, if I'm blindsided somewhere, I miss something, I want to know. And say, oh, yeah, he did say this or that. And it's my goal to stay like we're instructed to do in Titus 1, verse 9, to hold fast and teach as we as you were taught. That's the instruction to the ministry is what you have in Titus. And, you know, brethren, like I mentioned in the Bible study last night, all of you are being 
called to be kings and priests with Jesus Christ in the world tomorrow. And even if you're not an ordained minister at this moment in time, you're being trained to be a teacher, an instructor, a king, a priest in the world tomorrow. So these principles apply to you, too, that are here given to the ministry, the current ordained ministry, who should really be exercising vigilance and dig uh, being diligent about obeying this instruction of the ministry, which in verse 9 of Titus 1 says, holding fast the faith. You know, it says in verse 7, for a bishop must be. And then it continues off of that part of verse 7 here in verse 9. A, a, a bishop must be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So he's to preach as he has been taught and hold, be holding fast to that faithful word as he's been taught. So we go to the top human leader that God raised up for us. And by raising him up, he made him an apostle. I mentioned last night one of the proofs beside the many, 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 many fruits of outstanding works that God did through Mr. Armstrong, opened the doors, Mr. Armstrong walked through them, even though he said that in doing so, it was a lifetime of struggle for him. But he did it, and, and he said, but it wasn't my works. God was doing the works. God was opening the doors. He did his part of it, and God continued to keep him on top of it, and the fruits credit to him and God. You know, they credit to him as evidence of God working through this one man as the apostle and we who God has called to be part of the spiritual temple that God is building, that Mr. Armstrong made a reference to the temple, and that's the spiritual temple he made a reference to, and that's you and me, not a physical temple. And we, that spiritual temple, are another evidence of his apostleship. And you need that today because there are people that argue and poo-poo and speak against God's servant. We should stay very familiar with Numbers 12. Sometime we'll spend some time and go through that. Maybe if we have time after Mr. Armstrong speaks, I'll just close up with running through Numbers 12. Um, but I don't want to take away from his thunder over much today. I want to build on it uh, in the sense of, of the spiritual temple. I just want to say this. This week, I mentioned to some of you how on the Internet Ambassador Spokesman's Club, the topic was related to the spiritual temple. And Mr. Armstrong had mentioned, brethren, Jesus Christ is not returning to a physical temple in Jerusalem. He's returning to something much greater than that, a spiritual temple. And he explained how that spiritual temple is you and is me, is you and me, is us, the people whom God has called and weaved into the end time body of Jesus Christ. And though we are scattered, and that can be bewildering at times and confusing because um, on the internet people compete to get you into their group, you know. And, um, and unfortunately the influence from the group is often going to contain a lot of compromises. They're willing to let you know, I know I've stepped on a few toes. I know there's some people who, some women who've come here, uh, you know, that would be here that became very involved for a bit. And then as soon as I play one of Mr. Armstrong's sermons on makeup, which some of them just, well, we kind of ignore that part. But as soon as I back him up, they, oh, you're backing him up in that. Yes, you bet I am. We're, we're not compromising any doctrine, and there's a reason for it. The vanity that makeup is is so extreme, and that's the first sin Satan did. I mean, it was vanity that rose him up to say, why am I only here on the earth? I should have the rest of the universe. And he started talking to all of his, his angels who were under him. At that time, they were considered angels. And he started um, little by little working the idea that God is unfair into their minds. You know, we're stuck here on this earth, this beautiful earth. We're stuck here. And 
there's the rest of the universe out there that God has restricted us from. You know, just little by little working in this, yeah, that's not fair. Why are we only here? We should be out there too. Working up that idea that, see, God is not fair. Uh, uh, you know, and he was able to convince all of the angels under them, which we understand to be one-third of all the angels, because there's three archangels, and each under the archangels, the hierarchy, each had, each of those three archangels had one-third of the other angels under them. So Lucifer turned Satan, was able to convince the third under him to go up and attack God's throne because of the wrong idea that God had been unfair to them. And... So then they became rebels, they became demons. Lucifer's name was changed to Satan because he had become a devil or the devil. And um, there are people that respond to that influence today. But that was vanity that caused Lucifer to turn into a devil and become Satan the devil uh, through vanity. You know, he was designed very beautifully, all the pipes and he was the music maker. He was the morning star of the, the dawn of the morning, the morning star. Just beautifully made by God. And that beauty lifted up his vanity. And as Mr. Armstrong has explained, you know, when you put on a mask, which painting your face with makeup is masking it, that's not the real you. You're putting a mask over you. Uh, and, that, and that's false. And you're trying to create more beauty than you think God gave you when really mo a lot of us men, when you come down to the bottom line of it, we love your natural beauty, especially when it flows from the inside of you out with a smile and through your eyes. We just we see the beauty from the inside, which you can never you can never paint on that kind of beauty. And when you try to accelerate the physical beauty, it is you ruin it, you mar it, you cover up, you hide the real beauty with that colored mud. And the bottom line of it is not just what men physically think about it, it's what God thinks about it. As Mr. Armstrong has explained, the thing about that is, he, as he put it, he's, he said it this way, no woman wearing makeup, or today in this confused world, that you'd have to also say no person, because even you see men starting to wear makeup today. The president of France, Emmanuel Macron, he pays, uh, it's paid for by the voters of, you know, by the citizens of France. He pays a tremendous annual fee. It's in his budget for makeup. I mean, it's some incredible amount, like $30,000 a year, some huge, horrendous amount for his daily makeup. And so he paints on this face so he can go around looking super, you know, whatever, macho, uh, you know, painted. Uh, and God says that kind of vanity is not going to rise to meet Christ in the air. Uh, he said, no one wearing makeup. He actually said women, but I'm going to apply it to everybody. You know, by extension, no one wearing makeup is going to rise to meet Christ in the air when he returns. So some of you ladies may say, okay, well, the night before he comes, I'll, I'll throw it all away and not wear it anymore. You're not going to know the night before he comes. No man knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. God's going to work it out. Even though you, the, a countdown clock of three and a half years starts when the fifth seal opens up until the seventh trump of the seventh seal when Christ returns, as Christ explains himself in his own words when he was here on the earth in the flesh, he, in Matthew 24, he says, I'm cutting things short. I'm, I'm I'm, let's read it. Matthew 24, verse 22. If you want to flip there with me, I'm going to read it directly from the King James Version of the Bible. Verse 22, Matthew 24. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And so... He's cutting short that time. So you won't know the day or the hour. Now, even if, you, even if you say, yeah, but I know he's coming on the Feast of Trumpets. I believe that, you might say. Well, that's a possibility, but you're not going to know the year, what year that, if that were the case, you're not going to know the year that Feast of Trumpets is coming until 
the great tribulation occurs, until the fifth seal opens up. And once that opens up, that's, that's like God closing the door of the ark. Now, what do I mean by that, brethren? That, that means that once that door is shut, God has made a decision about what's going to happen to you, even if you're a part of the true church. There's two portions of the true church at the time the fifth seal opens up. There's a portion that's accounted worthy to escape under the criteria of Luke 21, verse 36. And there is the portion who God says, you blew it. You didn't do what Christ said do there in Luke 21, 36, even though Revelation 12, verse 17, you were keeping the commandments of God and had the testimony of God. You fell short. Therefore, I, had, I deemed you, I judged you as lukewarm, as he describes it in Revelation 3, verses 14 through 17. You thought you had it made. You thought you were spiritually hot shots. But you weren't doing everything Christ said do. And Luke 4.4, 4, Matthew 4.4, 4, God tells us we live not by bread alone, but by every word of God. And that includes the words in Luke 21.36, where Christ instructed us, saying, Therefore, because this great tribulation, verse 35, comes as a snare upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole world, in other words, upon everybody in the world, tout le monde, everybody in the world, it comes like a snare, like a thief in the night, totally unexpected. He says, because of that, watch so you'll have a good idea when the fifth seal is going to open up. Because he says in the parable of, of the tree, the fig tree and all the trees, he said, when you see the blossoms on the tree, when the limbs become tender and the little buds on the limbs begin to blossom, you know that summer is nigh, summer is near. He said, likewise, when you see these four seals bloom and blossom, when they become more frequent, more intense, know that the kingdom of God is near. Now, by that, Christ was saying, know that the fifth seal is about to open. The fifth seal begins a three-and-a-half-year countdown clock to the seventh trump of the seventh seal when Christ returns, symbolically returns. He doesn't have to come on that exact day if God just said, you know, I, let's just do it a little different here. You know, that, that day will still symbolize your return, but let's do it a little different. That's God's option. He's not absolutely bound to make it happen that day. But let's say he says, yeah, this day pictures that, and we're going to do it on that day. But you won't know the year that's going to happen until the Great Tribulation occurs. And even, even those of us watching may be suddenly surprised, and yet we'll be a because we were watching and praying, God will use that criteria to determine whether you're accounted worthy to escape the Great Tribulation or not. And here's the point for those who might say, well, I'll just wait, you know, I'll, I'll just keep wearing my makeup until a few days before Christ returns. Then I'll get rid of it. I'll repent. And then I get to rise and meet him in the air. Oh, no, that little approach, that sneaky little approach, that's not going to work for you women or men either if you're inclined to paint your face or wear a, a hairpiece or which you know it's that's 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 kind of quasi same thing as makeup you know if you lost your hair you lost your hair got to give you more hair in the resurrection but um i remember one of the evangelists one time i, I was instructed i had to take something up to his desk while he was speaking uh, on the in the auditorium when I walked up there, I almost wanted to do like they did with that old sports announcer, uh, Harold Co uh, Cos Cosell, uh, one of the big, tall, athletic guys. One day they were on stage together, and he just reached up, that big, tall guy, he actually just reached down, put his hand on the hairpiece of Howard, Howard Cosell and <laughs> yanked it off. That thought came to my mind while I was standing there, and... Uh, he was surprised that I brought up what I did. They had taken up an offering that day, uh, not even a holy day offering. It was just a regular Sabbath. They'd taken some special offering. And I, I kind of wish I'd said no to the head usher. He said, take this up there to him, Steve. I said, no, you take it up. You're the head usher. But I, I obeyed. I took it up there, laid it down, and he looked at me, and I said, well, they told me to bring you this offering up here. <laughs> and, uh, um I think, I think the head usher was doing that in part to embarrass him. I don't know. Like, we don't usually do this. 
But I was, the thought came in my head, you know, just reach down like the sports guy did with, uh, who was that, Muhammad Ali? Who, I forget who did it now, but reached down and grabbed his hair, grabbed him by the head of the hair and just pulled up and the hairpiece comes up in his hand. Uh, you know, that thought came to my mind. But I said, no, you know, the thoughts were also, you know, respect. Even though they're not respectable, they're doing this uh, uh, thing of apostasy. You know, maintain some dignity and respect. If you do anything with them, you should consult, do it privately with them, you know, not in front of the whole audience. But uh, it was very tempting. But, um, but I resisted that one. I'm kind of saying maybe you should have been bold and have gone ahead and done it. I don't know. But, but, but anyway, brother, there's some things you don't do. Um, but on this thing of, of makeup, Mr. Armstrong has explained, no woman wearing makeup is going to rise to meet Christ in the air. Now, it's never happened. It, uh, in the past, there have been women. I would, you'd see their pictures on social media where they're plastered with makeup. And, you know, after I would really strongly go into that, back up Mr. Armstrong with that, which some of you say, well, that's a small thing. Well, in and of itself, it may seem like a small thing, but when it violates the principle of vanity, that's a big thing. That's the sin that got Satan, got, they got Lucifer off track, was lifting himself up in the vanity of his beauty and how as wonderful as I, Lucifer, the great beautiful archangel am, I should be ruling the whole universe. I should be on the seat of the throne of my creator, God. I mean, he was thought like a, became, his thoughts became like a Frankenstein monster. Vanity. And so vanity is a big spiritual thing. And you need to wash that vanity off your face. Now, every time I've backed that up, I've, when there have been women that you see in their pictures wearing makeup, they stop tuning in. And they stop communicating with me, and it's like uh, they're offended greatly. They won't even respond to, you know, hello or anything like that. <clears throat> and um, they used to be very communicative, very involved, but they don't like it. You're upholding that. And, they, and then you see their pictures. You go back and look. I just looked at one the other day that hadn't been with us for about a year. And now, instead of just a little makeup, she's really plastering it on. So when you rebel, your mind, you get, you're getting yourself off track. As Mr. Armstrong said, no woman wearing makeup is going to rise to meet Christ in the air because you're practicing rebellion. Rebellion is as witchcraft, and it's a violation of vanity. And you violate something, you don't repent of it. It's not just that one thing. You're going to go off the track all over the place. So you should take heed if you're wearing, well, I'm just wearing a little, you know, you'll be wearing more if you don't stop it. And you'll find yourself going off track. You'll start compromising. You'll find other people you want to listen to because, hey, Stephen, this other minister over here, he lets me wear makeup. Yeah, well, he's probably letting you do all kind of sin. That is a direct sin. That is a direct violation of an instruction of our end time apostle left as a doctrine in the church. There's no, only, a, only an apostle can set doctrine. There is no new apostle who can change that doctrine. So, all right, enough on that. We've got to save time for Mr. Armstrong. And I said we would cover some things from 1 Corinthians 7. The songs did help me wake up a little bit here with you, brethren. Let's go to... Um, well, let me, let me put it here while I rotate the scriptures. We don't want to start right at verse 1, but that's where I wind up when I punch this. Um, we want to get to the verses where, well, actually, some of this is pretty good. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have their own husband. Verse 3, now, uh, he'll cover the other side of that, too, in a moment. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. Without mentioning a name, I'm very happy to mention to you, brethren, that one of the Imperial High School students who was in a class that I taught and even helped me teach it as a student teacher, uh, assisting me, um, her husband had been abusive to her going back about 14 years ago. 
and they separated. And just this past week, I learned that they have um, become reunited. The wife feels safe to move back in with the husband. I think he may have learned his lesson. And uh, even though they're in a group that has really compromised on some things, the wife does understand the truth about it. She's let me know, hey, I understand that my dad even was wrong about that. And if she maintains that understanding and truth, she may be able to use this principle of 1 Corinthians 7 since she would be the, the converted one with a husband acting unconverted, her behavior, her conduct, her standing firm in the faith, if she does, could help his conversion. Well, you'll see that in a moment when we get to it. And that's what I wanted to, to get to for the sake of some who have an unconverted mate. Um, the wife has not power over her own body, but the husband, likewise the husband, not power over his own body, but the wife on the due benevolence thing. Even if you're fasting, defraud not one another, except it be with consent for a time. You need to let your mate know if you're going to fast ahead of time. Hey, honey, I'm going to be fasting, and I don't want to do this due benevolence thing during the fasting. Um, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and, and then after the fasting and prayer, come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency, and, and Paul says here in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 7, I speak this by permission, not of commandment, what he's about to say next. But God upheld it. He says, you know, what those in authority, and when he says two or more, he's talking about in my, and in my name, that's, you gotta, those two have to be in the authority line of, of Christ, of God. And God upheld it by putting, making this a part of his inspired word, which God filters seven times over. So God is behind this permission given to us through Paul, not of commandment, but speaking it of permission, an option that you have. Starting in verse 7, I would that all men, even as myself, be, I wish that all men were, even as myself, you know, he was unmarried, <clears throat> married, but every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner, one after another. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them if they abide even as I, Apostle Paul, abides, unmarried. He said, it's good. I speak it by permission, not of commandment, he was saying. But if a person cannot contain, if they, the widows or those unmarried, cannot contain... Let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. Paul says, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians. I think you can see this with me staying on the screen. So while we're scrolling through them, I'm just going to stay here with you. And verse 10, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord makes this command. He's saying, I'm, he's repeating a command of the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. That's verse 10. And verse 11, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or, or be reconciled. Like the one young lady who was this week, I don't feel comfortable mentioning their name at this moment in time. So let's just say the one woman I know this week who reconciled with her husband after being separated and remaining unmarried for a long time. Uh, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled, get back together with the husband and the husband. Let not the husband put away his wife, even if she's unconverted. If she's pleased to dwell with you, you know, the Apostle Paul points out, this is a command of God. I, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. It's the Lord's command, God's command. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Same thing for the man, if they're pleased to dwell with you. It'll cover that more in just a moment. But unto the rest, I, not the Lord, speak. If any brother has a wife that believes not. In other words, as you should understand here, if you've got an unconverted mate who believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with you, with him, the woman pleased to dwell with the man, though she's unconverted, let the man, let him not put her away. 
verse 13, and the woman, same thing, which has a husband that believes not. If you're a, a wife and you've got an unconverted husband and he's pleased to dwell with you, uh, then you don't leave him. Let her, the wife, not leave the man. Let her not leave him. In verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by a believing wife and vice versa. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by a believing husband. Else your children be unclean. Else were your children unclean. And Mr. Armstrong explained this part of this verse is telling us that church kids, 1 Corinthians 7 kids, you kids who grow up in the church where you've had a parent, even if it's only one parent, who's been a part of the, the body of Christ, the church of God, a spiritual organism, if you've just got one parent that's part of the church, you are not like the rest of the kids of this world in that you are not cut off from God like the world's kids are cut off from God. Since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, after eating the forbidden fruit, were driven out of the garden and angels with flaming swords barring the way to the tree of life so they couldn't go also eat the tree of life and then live forever as sinners after having eaten the forbidden fruit until God allows them to repent. But God, because of that sin, caused the whole world, cut off, it, that sin cut off the whole world except for the few God is calling now. And so all the kids of everybody else, they're cut off from God. Unless they've got one parent who's been called, then the kids are sanctified. They're set apart. They're not cut off from God the way the rest of the world's kids are. They are holy. But now they, even the kids, are holy in the sense they're not cut off from God. They're sanctified, not cut off from God. However, Mr. Epstein explained, this doesn't mean those kids are automatically called and the kids that wouldn't want to be called now are forced into it. Even those God calls now have to be chosen after the calling. You have to respond to it in such a way that God says, all right, I'm going to choose you. And once he chooses you, man, the switch, uh, it, uh, not the switch, but the uh, something, something's been set where you don't have, once you're chosen, you don't have a second resurrection opportunity anymore. It's either you make the first or you're going to third. You know, you get called out on third base at Lake of Fire. So either make the first resurrection or you burned up and have eternal death. Not eternal burning, but eternal death. Um, first or third, if you're called. So the kids, they have to want it. They have to tell God, hey, I want this first resurrection. I don't want to ding around here for the second, you know, and go through the thousand-year millennium and wait and be called then. Uh, I, I, want to, I want you to call me now. I want to be part of this. I want to be married to Jesus Christ. I want to be contributing uh, spiritually and otherwise to the work you're doing now in preparation for training kings and priests for the world tomorrow. And I want to be one of those kings and priests and sit on the throne with Christ and be part of his collective bride. You tell God you want that? Okay. You're a kid in the church with one parent? Bingo, you got it. But if you don't, he'll just leave you hanging like the rest of the kids till the second resurrection. But it, you got the option that they don't have unless God starts to call them. Even when I was begging God to show me where's your church, he'd put a call on me to have that and other questions in my mind. And I responded to it in a way that pleased God and they caused God to say, okay, Stephen, I'm going to choose you. You responded well to my call. And if you hadn't, if you hadn't shown that kind of interest with your particular background, I probably would not have called you. <laughs> I mean, chose you. I wouldn't have chosen you unless you really showed some teeth about wanting this calling after I introduced you to it, made you wonder, where is my church? Matthew 16, 18, God put that on my mind. And I said, yeah, where is that church? And it wasn't a passing fancy for one day. I, I fasted. Uh, well, for well, I was fasting during that time, but not the whole three weeks. But I stayed up 
all night for three weeks, praying all through the night. God, where's that church? Show me where's that church. And I would read all day in the Bible. And uh, I was just worn out, exhausted after three weeks. And God answered that by bringing the same questions, which was more than just the one about where's your church. I was asking him specific things like, well, why are there so many churches, meaning denominations? Why are there so many denominations, all a Baptist on this corner, Methodist across the street, Presbyterian on the next corner, on the other corner of the street, and just half a block down the road, this huge, humongous Catholic facility building, you know, where they even have Catholic schools. You know, how come so many denominations? And what else was I asking him? Most well, several other things. Why, you know, why killing and why war? And then the very things I was asking, Mr. Armstrong opened up the program, the first program I heard, with those same questions I've been asking in prayer for three weeks. So there's an example of answered prayer. But God chose me after calling me when I showed that kind of response. You kids who are not cut off from God, you still have to tell God you want the first resurrection. You can't go around saying, oh, well, my parents were in the church. I grew up in the church, and God forced me into this thing. Oh, no, he didn't. He left you the option. You know, you're not cut off like the rest of the world, but you still got to seek him and tell him, I want this first resurrection. Otherwise, even though you may think you've been called, uh, you, may, you may think you've been chosen, unless you've told God you really want it, you haven't been. You're just dinging around in the church, you know, and you're going to accept that God may give you some mercy if you're very young. God's not going to take somebody who's accounted worthy to escape and leave their little kids here to suffer the great tribulation. The kids are going to get to go. Uh, God is merciful, and we'll have some kids over there in the wilderness with those who are part of uh, those accounted worthy to escape. Those kids will get to live on over into the world tomorrow for the most part. Now, if they're rebellious kids, God's going to let a scorpion or a snake bite them. Uh, <laughs> he'll deal with it some way. Uh, anyway. I was saying, if you're a kid and you get over there and you got a smart aleck, bad attitude, God may deal with you. We're in a wilderness. He's going to have to constantly be protecting us from wild animals in the wilderness. So that's not that's not going to be a party over there, even though you're kind of worthy to escape and it's protected from the from the the beast of Revelation 17 verse 8, the seventh king, who with the false prophet. Comes the emperor, the new emperor of a revived Holy Roman Empire, that beast. There will be other beasts, little animal beasts in the wilderness that God will be constantly protecting us from. You misbehave, God can say, we need to get rid of this one. I'm not going to protect him. Let that scorpion or a whole bunch of scorpions just have at him. <laughs> uh, you know, listen, God, friends, God is on top of this whole thing, even during this time of scattering. And we can be encouraged. We can have this fellowship with one another, even electronically. And we all rally with one another. Patrick, did you notice when you were having a problem with the echo, several people jumped in there and said, hey, try this, try that, you know, so you get rid of it. And they let you know they weren't having a problem, which I appreciated seeing because then I, then I said, okay, my controls are okay. It's something else going on out there between you and Facebook or on your particular device. And uh, Patrick, you're invited, as well as others who might have an interest in taking your uh, recording device and make a five-minute video on how I came into the church and then send it to me, and I might start playing those. So we, got, we get the icebreaker with one another, get to know one another who are quasi-fellowshipping on the Sabbath you know, in this electronic way, we can maybe find some ways to have more interaction, which could be good. And brethren, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling and noticing from the news, unless God decides, well, there's still a reason I'm going to delay it. It's my desire, First Peter 3, verse 8 and 9, it's my desire that none perish. I'm checking myself to see if I got First Peter right. It might be Second Peter where God says it's his will, you know, meaning his desire. He's not going to force it on anybody, but it's his desire, his will, that 
none perish. And those who uh, are called now, by the way, I saw one of you, I forget who it is at the moment, uh, actually speak contrary to what God says on this. Uh, let me come back to that to see if it's First Peter. No, it is, it's Second Peter, I should have said. Second Peter 3 and verses 8 and 9, especially verse 9. First Peter 8, he points out that with God, time is different than for the rest of us. A day can be like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day for God. I mean, for us, that can't be. None of us are going to live to be a thousand years old in this flesh. We don't have any concept of what a thousand years really is like. So a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day to God. We can at least get this idea that, wow, a day for God can be like a long time, or a long time can be like a day, either way, for God. Uh, so this delay of 30 plus years since Mr. Armstrong has died, or even 40 plus years from the time when there was some thinking that God might wrap things up in 1972, wrap it up by opening up the fifth seal and then going through three and a half years of great tribulation with those accounted worthy to escape, being in that place of safety, protection, uh, nourishment, final training. God refers to it as a place of nourishment. He's going to provide our food even for us as well as protection. But in 1 Peter 3 verse 9, after saying a day is as a thousand years, time is not the same thing with God as it, as it is for us. So the point there being that 30 or 40 years for God, delaying it so that, you know, people he's called now. And this is what one of you said that's different. Um, it's re related to judgment. Those who are in, those who God has called and chosen now and put into the body of, of Christ, we are being judged now. Our judgment is not after Christ returns. You're going to, we're being judged right now. And even Luke 21, 36 is not only telling us the criteria for being accounted worthy to escape. At the end of that verse, Christ explains that's also the criteria for, being whether, for whether you're being accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man in the first resurrection. You've got to do that Luke 21, 32 stuff, those two prerequisites there, watching the daily events related to the four active seals, and praying without ceasing with all your heart, soul, might, and mind about the people affected by the events of the daily four seals. You've got to be putting in that kind of effort in prayer to pray with all your heart, soul, might, and mind without ceasing about the people who are affected by false religion, war, whether injured or somebody in your family killed, and rumors of war and world war, and affected by famine. Ten, ten million people in North Korea reported this week are going to be facing severe starvation, famine, because of a lack of food production there. And people who suffer from the fourth seal, death by disease epidemics, pestilence, eventually plagues of Egypt, and by seismus, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, cyclones, hurricanes, natural disasters of all kinds, seismus, as Christ explained it, and death by animals, and death by trouble, general trouble, the beginning of sorrows that leads up to the mega trouble of the fifth seal, great tribulation, worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world, to the time coming just ahead of us, and no nor ever after. No time of trouble is going to ever be as bad as this great tribulation coming that you can escape if you're watching and praying without ceasing. I emphasize that, brother, because that's something we have to make an effort and do. And it affects our salvation. We can disqualify from salvation by not doing that. Now, what will that mean if you disqualify on the basis of Luke 21, 36? It means you have... You do have a second opportunity, but boy, is it a costly one. If, you get le if you're not accounted worthy to be in the first resurrection because 
when the door closes, when the fifth seal opens up, I was saying earlier, it's like when God closed the door of the ark. Oh, there were bunches of people now down below the ark shouting up to Moses, Hey, Moses, man, we repent of all that stuff we said against you and all that laughing at you. Hey, we see the rain now. Hey, buddy, open that door. We, yeah, we, we're with you. We hear, we know what you said is true now, so let us in. We want to ride it out on the ark, in the ark there, and be protected. Too late, Bubba. Even if, even if Noah had wanted to open the door for some of his good, close friends, he had to respond to them, I'm sorry, I'm not able to open the door. God closed it, and the door on you is sealed. That's what will happen to come upon the opening of the fifth seal. I'll just keep my makeup on till the day before or two Christ returns. Sorry, you got that makeup on when that fifth seal opens up. You just, you just, you just got accounted unworthy to escape. You're going to be left behind to face the tribulation. We're not going to have makeup carted off on two wings of an eagle over to the place of safety. That ain't going to be there. Obedience to what a doctrine that God set in the church through his end-time apostle. And those of you who think, wow, what was Mr. Armstrong's doing? You better think again. Mr. Armstrong spoke to us under the inspiration of the eternal Lord God. And God bound it, backed it up, because he does that with his servants, especially with an apostle. And so, um, you know, you'd be wise to get it off now before that fifth seal closes the door on you. Did I read everything I said I was going to read? We've got to go to Mr. Armstrong to finish in, in a timely way today. Yeah, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering is patient. A day with him is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day, 30, 40, 50 years, not a big deal to God. Some of you may say, well, that God, he delayed this thing. It ain't going to happen now. That delay is less than like a day, like a drop in the bucket to God. And it's for a reason. Because he says he's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. And what I was trying to bring out about our being judged now, you know, is that if we don't get with the picture now, once that door closes of the ark, too late to repent, then you've been judged. You have been judged. You're gonna. You're hitting the lake of fire, Bubba. Uh, our judgment is now, not later. Our judgment is now, right now. Rest of the world, as God has explained through His end-time apostle, they are not being judged now. They'll have their day of judgment. We're being judged daily, brother. We need to be repenting daily and asking God to that part of the model prayer where we say, God. Give us our daily bread and especially your Holy Spirit, not just physical food. Give us your Holy Spirit. That's a request he cannot deny. He says, I want to give you that more than a, a human father wants to give a kid food. So ask God for his Holy Spirit and forgive me my sins as I forgive others. Man, forgive others and get that forgiveness for yourself. And this part especially of the model prayer. Lead us, not just me, but my brethren too. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from that evil one, that Lucifer turned Satan with vanity that got a third of the angels to think that God was unfair and went up to try to take over his throne. Ask God to, to uh, lead us not into evil and to protect us against that evil one, restrain that evil one against us who has sucking power to get us attracted to sin. Ask God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from that evil, very powerful being. Put a, a barrier between us and him, Father, your spirit, and the filling of our minds with your word and with the doing of your word, helping act as a barrier against that evil one. Deliver us from that evil one. Lead us not into temptation. For yours, Father, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory which Jesus Christ qualified to usher in and restore 
after fighting the supreme battle for world rulership. That's what that battle with Satan was. It was a battle for world rulership. The God of this world, Satan the devil, is on that throne right now. Christ is qualified to knock him off of it, but the Father said, let's leave him on there, finish out the 6,000 years, let him work for us to be like the weights at a gym for the brethren who are called, something to resist and build spiritual muscle as a result of. All right, I got to use the discipline to cut off and go to Mr. Armstrong so we can finish timely today and within two hours. We've got this sermon coming up right here from 1979, God's End Time Apostle, Herbert W. Armstrong, going to speak to us again today to finish up. We'll just have time for Mr. Armstrong's speaking brethren and I'll say bye-bye right after that. Thanks for joining me today on this Sabbath service, a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K. Let's finish it up with another sermon excerpt, be filled with God's Word and His Spirit as we hear God's end time apostle finish this service for us for this Sabbath day, the 20th day, second month, May 25, 2019. Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. Why should a condition of utopia with perfect government, a perfect society, perfect conditions, perfect living conditions, why should that be impossible? where everybody loves everybody else, where everybody wants to cooperate with and help everybody else. And everybody else trying to help you. We're trying to help one another. Why, if we could all do that, how nice that would be. And what's wrong about it? Why can't we have that kind of a condition on earth? Jesus Christ came as a messenger, a messenger of the covenant, and that was the new covenant. The old covenant joined uh, Israel and God together in a husband and wife relationship, but it made Israel one of this world's nations. As I mentioned before, Israel did not have the Holy Spirit of God. They were just a carnal, ordinary human uh, worldly nation in a sense, but they did have God's laws. They did have God's revelation of fact and truth and knowledge. And, but they did not take advantage of it. And it showed that unless the heart is converted, and unless we receive the Spirit of God, and our whole lives have been changed, that even the knowledge of God cannot be understood. A natural mind cannot understand the things that God has prepared for us. Neither can it know them, because they are spiritually uh, discerned. And the natural mind cannot discern spiritual things. The natural mind of man is incomplete. It's only half there. I said a while ago that God creates in a process of duality. Now, you take the man himself. It not only first he is uh, made of matter and later will be of spirit, but he starts out with a carnal mind. We need to understand something about the mind of man. And that is that uh, uh, God put a spirit in man. Job said there is a spirit in man. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, you read that eye has not seen nor ear heard, and most of the knowledge we have has come through the eyes or the ears, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You can't see those things through a natural eye, and you won't hear them through a natural ear. But God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. Now, if you do not have the Spirit of God, then He has not revealed it to you. That's all there is to it. And these things of God to the natural carnal mind in this world are just so much foolishness. On the other hand, God says that the wisdom of this world and all of its great intellects is just foolishness with God. Absolute foolishness. You see, the spirit in man imparts the power of intellect to a physical brain. The human brain is almost precisely like uh, the animal brain, 
For example, the elephant and the dolphin, the whale, all have larger brains than the human brain, and the uh, shemp uh, almost as large, and their brains are just like ours. As a matter of fact, I think scientists will say that the human brain is just ever so slightly superior because they want to believe that. I doubt if it is superior, actually, but it's very, very slight. And yet the output of the human brain or the human mind is thousands of times that of the, of, of, of the dumb animals. And uh, they don't have minds to think with. They don't reason, come to conclusions, make decisions. They can't think creatively. Man can, but man usually is thinking in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons and the wrong purposes. And yet man has never known what that gospel is that Jesus brought. Christ came with the good news, and the word gospel means good news, of the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is not the millennium. The kingdom of God is the family of God that will be the governing family ruling the earth during the millennium. One of the first things that Christ will do is to change a lot about human nature. This spirit in man imp imputes the power of intellect to a physical brain. But it's the physical brain that does the thinking. It's the physical brain that sees through the eye. It's the physical brain that hears through a physical ear, that smells through a physical nose, that tastes through a physical mouth, and feels through physical fingers, and so on. And that's the way knowledge comes into the human being, is through those five senses. Now, when it comes to spiritual knowledge, you can't see spirit, you can't hear it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, you can't feel it. So the average person can know nothing about it. Now the spirit in man is just like so much spiritual essence, like so much air. It's not a ghost, it's not a being, it has no life of its own, it does not impart the life to us. I mentioned a while ago that the human life is in the blood. So says your Bible. And in the breath, which is the breath of life. That's where our life is. And if there was no spirit in us at all, we'd be just like the dumb animals. They're just like a human being, except they're not in the form and shape of God, and we are. And they don't have that spirit. God put that spirit in us to make it possible for us to have a contact with him because man was created in the image of God. God is reproducing himself. <clears throat> and I don't know any church, even in what is called Christianity, that knows that. I don't know of a one. The Bible is full of it. I saw it for years before I could believe it. I said, well, I, I, I thought that would be blasphemy to believe that we will be born of God until we become very God ourselves. That just seemed to be impossible, and I, I didn't want to blaspheme. I didn't want to say that we're going to be equal with God. Well, in authority, we won't be. But in every other way, we will. And God has willed it that way. That, that is God's will. And that's why we're here. God had a great reason for putting humanity on the earth. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. Thing I want to call your attention to and that that, that uh, just brings to my mind I hadn't thought of before is that uh, it says in uh, Haggai which is just before Zechariah and Zechariah is the next to the last book in the Old Testament that the temple they were building would be far more glorious than the former temple which was Solomon's temple now the temple they built was not anywhere near as glorious as Sol Solomon's temple but they were building the temple Christ is to come to, and it said this latter temple, this latter day temple, and the temple Christ will come to is to be a far more glorious temple than Solomon's temple. Now think of that. Haven't you wondered about the temple? Well, in some of the things I've been writing and some of the books that are coming out, that'll all be explained. 
because God has been revealing all of that. We used to wonder, are the Jews going to demolish the Dome of the Rock that belongs to the Muslims over there and, uh, and put up a new temple? I'd say no chance, no chance. And yet Christ is coming to a far more glorious temple. The church is the, the family, the household of God, as you read in the second chapter of Ephesians, and it is built up unto a glorious holy temple in the Lord. And we, the church, is the temple to which Christ is coming. And he's coming, the temple is his wife, and he's going to marry that temple. He's going to marry a church. And in the New Testament, I find that church is well organized. It is joined together. As the Apostle Paul said that we must all speak the same thing. Now in Corinth, some of them wanted to follow Paul, some Apollos, some wanted to follow Peter, and a few maybe wanted to follow Christ. He says, you can't ever get into God's kingdom that way. He said, I am Paul. I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except just maybe one or two. Paul was explaining how that church must be compacted together. That means like cemented together, joined tightly together, not all loose. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, and then prophets, and primarily the prophets that he speaks of are the Old Testament prophets. I wonder if you ever realized that. Do you know there are only one or two prophets mentioned in the New Testament? I think Agabus was the name of one, but you hardly ever remember the names of them. You don't, there was one prophetess, by the way. But their sole duty was to receive a, a message direct from God, and, and God communicated direct to them, and they carried that message on to the apostles. But they themselves had no administrative office. They didn't preach, they didn't teach. They just received the message and took it to the apostle. Now, I know that there's no, uh, no such uh, uh, living uh, prophet in the church today for the simple reason they would have brought it to me if there was, and no one ever has. Of course, I, I know, I, I've had men come to me who said that they were Elijah, and some men have come to me and said that they are Napoleon, and uh, uh, so on, but uh, I, I rather doubted that. And uh, anyway, Christ is coming to this wonderful temple, and Christ had a message about the kingdom of God, which is the family of God, the household of God, of which God the Father is the head of that family. We are to marry Christ when we are changed to immortality. Now you see, the church to which Christ is coming is going to meet him in the air, but the dead will rise first, and we who are alive and remain at that time will be changed to immortality. No more flesh and blood. I won't have to worry about my heart still ticking because there won't be any heart. We'll just be composed of spirit. We will be spirit. Now this spirit, when God wanted to have King Cyrus of the Persian Empire write out a uh, decree to send a small colony of Jews back over to Jerusalem, 70 years after Jerusalem had been invaded and the temple had been destroyed and the Jews had all been moved out of there. Now God wanted a number of Jews to go back and build the second temple. When God wanted to get this message through to King Cyrus of ancient uh, the Persian Empire, he stirred up the spirit in Cyrus. That spirit is there, but it can't think, but it is connected with the mind, and it, uh, it, 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 it got the message through the spirit into the brain of Cyrus, and he wrote out the proclamation. And the Jews went back and built that temple. Now they're going back and building that temple is a type of the temple being built today, by the way. And I, uh, uh, sometimes I take a little satisfaction when I see that the governor over them, the one who was the builder of that temple, was Zerubbabel. 
And it said that Zerubbabel's hands have started this temple. They shall finish it. He's only a type of someone to build the temple to whom Christ will come. And sometimes I've wondered, could that mean that God will keep me alive until the temple is complete? Well, what else can it mean? You tell me what it does mean then, if that isn't what it means. What else does it or could it mean? Because uh, the, the whole purpose of the book is a prophecy. These books in the Old Testament are the prophecy. You see, God's church is founded on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, let me explain about the prophets. What they wrote in 1 Corinthians, let me see, it's the 10th chapter, I believe, 1 Corinthians, is for our admonition on whom the ends of the world has come. And Paul wrote to Timothy that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, what scriptures did Timothy know from a child? All of the Old Testament, the New hadn't been written yet which are able to make you wise unto salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. We are being built into that wonderful, glorious temple in the Lord that Christ is going to come to. Now, why was Christ born? Let's go back a little bit into the, one of the prophets, the ninth chapter of Isaiah, verse 6 on to 7, where this was written to Israel of the Old Testament, but nevertheless, it's a message for us because few of the old Israelites ever got it anyway. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, now notice that word government, the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, because there will be a time of peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the eternal of hosts will perform it. So it will be done. Now if we turn on over to the beginning of Christ's gospel in the New Testament. Mark 1 verse 1 the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I will send a messenger before thy face to prepare the way before thee. Now, that's quoted from Malachi, the third chapter, and the first verse. And if you turn back there, you will find that uh, it talks about Christ coming as a messenger of the covenant. But a human messenger will prepare the way before him. But if you read on, it's talking about his second coming. Read verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6 in Malachi 3. It is not talking about his first coming. Now, it's true that there was a messenger who prepared the way before his first coming, and that was John the Baptist. But he was only a type of one to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And God was going to give him a people back of him to support him. Now, when do you think that's going to start? Brethren, I tell you, there's some things we need to begin to think about. And God is beginning to reveal to me things now since he raised me from the dead that I never knew before. And I'm going to bring them to you. And let me tell you something. The difference between this church and all others is this is the work of the living God. And everything else is the work of man. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. John the Baptist then is mentioned beginning verse 2 here in Mark 1. And then we come down to verse 14 after Christ then had been baptized and had met Satan and conquered him. Now after the John was put in prison... Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, which means good news, wonderfully good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the family of God that will do the ruling 
It is both the government of God and the family of God, but it's the family of God who will do the ruling. And saying, the time is fulfilled. Why? Because Christ had just simply qualified by conquering Satan. Now, this kingdom of God that he talked about is a time of utopia, real utopia. I wish you'd stop and think. Why should a condition of utopia with perfect government, a perfect society, perfect conditions, perfect living conditions, why should that be impossible? Where everybody loves everybody else, where everybody wants to cooperate with and help everybody else, and everybody else trying to help you. We're trying to help one another. Why, if we could all do that, how nice that would be. And what's wrong about it? Why can't we have that kind of a condition on earth? I'll tell you why. It's because there is this Satan. And because he is a spirit being of very, very, very vastly great power. And he is broadcasting. And he's the prince of the power of the air. And he is surcharging the air with his attitude of bitterness and resentment. Of his attitude of rebellion. His attitude of vanity and exalting the self, but his attitude of hostility and uh, jealousy and envy and competition and strife and violence against others and tearing down instead of building up. Human nature was not created by God. That's what I wanted to speak on last night. God did not create human nature. You go back into Genesis and before Satan got to Eve and got to Adam through Eve, You'll notice, God gave Adam one thing to do. He says, Adam, I want you to name all the animals of the field. I've created all these animals, and they're here for a purpose, to help you in one way or another. So go ahead and name them. Adam went right ahead and named them all. He didn't say, oh, go do it yourself. He didn't say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to resent to what, what are you trying to boss me around for? Not until after Satan got to him. Oh no, it was Satan that pumped that thing we call human nature into him. A child is not born with human nature. Human nature is something that is not transmitted by heredity. We didn't receive that from Adam, we received it from Satan the devil. And if you turn to Ephesians 2 and read it from the first, you will find that's a wonderful chapter. The Ephesians 1 is a beautiful piece of English, and Ephesians 2 is a beautiful piece of wonderful truth. It'll tell you, too, that we are the household of God, to be joined together and not separated, and how Satan is the prince of the power of the air and is working in the people of this world. Now, they don't know it, but they all have this spirit. That's what gives them mind power. And just as God was able to reach Cyrus by stirring up the spirit in him, Satan stirs up the spirit of all humans from the time before they're even one year old, as soon as the, uh, an infant's brain begins to work. Satan begins to get selfishness in there. He begins to instill uh, hostility toward others. He begins to instill rebellion. So they don't want to mind mommy and daddy. That's where that comes from. It didn't come from God. Now then, when Christ comes, I want you to notice next now, one of the first things he's going to do, the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, and verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nation no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he'll have to be released for just a little while. So when Christ comes, one of the first things he's going to do, and that's what we celebrated just 10 days ago in the Day of Atonement, and I hope you heard a sermon on that point. That was to show us how Christ is going to do away with Satan, and how in the millennium we'll have perfect conditions, because in the kingdom of God there won't be any Satan. Now human nature is what Satan is pumping into people now. And when Christ comes, what is it going to be pumped into them? Turn back here, let me see, Second Peter, first chapter and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Not human nature, 
we receive through the Holy Spirit, we receive and become partakers of the divine nature. Now you weren't born of the divine nature. That's, uh, nature doesn't mean something you're born with. It's something that has become so much habit, it's like they call it second nature. Because it's habit, it's habitual. But it does not mean what you were born with. God did not, what is human nature? Human nature is hostile against God and not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, Romans 8, verse 7. It is the human heart which is uh, uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can understand about it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. That's human nature. And that comes from Satan. And when Christ comes, Satan is going to be put away. And instead, Christ will be here and his spirit will be surcharging the air and everyone is going to be called to salvation. All right, brethren, another outstanding sermon excerpt by God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong. A lot we can glean from that. We're out of time, so I've got to just quickly say thanks for joining us. I'll look forward to seeing you next time, next Friday night on the Friday Night Bible Study. If you missed the Bible Study last night during the rest of the time you have here on the Sabbath, I would encourage you to go back to the uh, archive, cogtv.org, or you can find it on the Sabbath service page on Facebook Live, and look for the date for last night. That would have been May 24, 2019. And catch that Bible Study. There's another outstanding sermon excerpt by God's End Time Apostle and... I did a little inspired preaching last night during the Bible study, too. And then uh, we'll be back again, God willing, next Sabbath morning for the Sabbath service. And then during the week on World Watch, Sunday through Thursday night, uh, World Watch TV, both on Facebook Live and World Watch TV. Uh, where, where, where do we do that? Worldwatch.tv. Yeah. Um, all right, brethren, thanks for joining me. Happy rest of the Sabbath and make it, make it profitable and edifying. Till next time, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert, Shabbat Shalom, Happy Sabbath.